a lot of what I'm going to go over you're familiar with. It's just making sure that you put it in your brain for what's necessary for college. So essential documents, we, we constantly call it just the modifications. And then there is a supplement, and the supplement was updated about a month ago. So you have to make sure you have the newest one. And then Jeanette Doucette publishes usually on the 1st and 15th of the month, rule updates. So you need all of those. And there is also an archive from last year, because many of the questions from last year still apply. When you go onto the NAWGJ website, Brenda has very nicely pulled out from the supplement a list of individual items. Most of these, if you want to look it up, you can read them. The reason I put a star beside the yellow card incident report is you probably want to make a few copies of those. Because if you're in a situation where you need to give a yellow card, you're going to have to do a report whether you only give the warning or you give the deduction. And I'll talk about that more later. Okay, meet preparation. Most of you do this already. These are just reminders. If you're traveling, confirm your travel arrangements. We have had judges end up in the wrong city. We have had judges miss their flight. So just make sure that everything is correct. Organize your judging materials. Make your judging sheets. The rapid reviews on NAWJ.org, I found last season, they were an excellent way to just quickly review the event I was going to judge. Review the modifications and the supplement for the event you're going to be judged. You could also review the written test questions on your event, just as a way to remind you of some of the different rules. Practice judge the collegiate routines that are on the website, and if you're going to be a chief judge, you need to select the video clips that are going to be reviewed either at the meet or in advance. It's really preferred it be done at the meet so you can get your mind off the age group rules. The judges assigning system, the first one you've heard from me over and over again, availability, updating it, the assigners who are working still with changes to meets, it's much faster for them to go in to the system and see who's available. If you get weekends that have opened up, go right in and put that availability in. Things will happen. Maybe weather, maybe illness. We will need judges through the whole season to fill positions that have changed for some reason. Also go into your payment information page on the meet you're assigned to. Some of the schools and some of the invitationals are very lax about putting detailed information in. You should get it with your contract as well, but if there's something missing on the payment information page, you can check with your assigner, and their email address is at the bottom left side of that page. Now, some of you have asked, how do I get credit for meet referee training? This year, if you fulfilled tonight's clinic or its makeup and next week's clinic, then you will have fulfilled meet referee training for this year. So you need to go into jazz, indicate in there that, that you've done that. Also make sure that you indicate that you read the manual, which hopefully you did last summer when it came out. If you're a new judge, you need to indicate that you've attended all three of the clinics. Event assignments are done two different ways. On the regular season meets, the assigner will do the event assignments. For the conference meets, they're done by the meet referee, and I distribute to them your choices for event assignments so they have those to work with. And I've said before that I know some of you feel that you could judge anything, but it's helpful to us to know what your preferences are. So those will be coming, but they will not be coming till after the beginning of the year. One thing that changed this year that I'm not sure everyone's clear on is we have had invitational meets starting a year ago. Some of them got larger, and so they were three or four sessions. And the NAWGJ 
Jazz Committee determined that those really shouldn't count as one meet because if you went and judged two meets in a day, which sometimes happens in some places, that would be two meets. So in counting your number of meet assignments, those were split up. The judges are assigned in most cases are exactly the same. So your event assignment will probably be the same for those. One of the concerns that both the Coaches Association and the Judges Association have been worried about is the number of declines this year. Remember that when you put your availability into the system, you are telling the assigners that you are free on that date to go judge a meet. Things come up, we realize that, but the assigners get very frustrated when they have to replace a judge and they go through five or six people and each one says, oh, I took another meet. Oh, I can't do it that weekend. When you decline a meet, it goes to all of the assigners so they will know not to use you on that particular weekend. Okay, this next slide is just a reminder how the judges' assigning system and NAWGJ are involved with the colleges. We are the assigning body. We don't issue the contracts. The contracts are issued by the institution. So NAWGJ does not have authority to break a contract, and we have said this to the coaches as well. We can counsel a judge if during the winter when we're doing evaluations there are concerns, but we can't pull a judge from the meet. This next slide is a change, and it was to our benefit. At the convention last spring, they voted to go back to what we did about two years ago which is that a judge can have five assignments. So you could have two at home, two away, and also be a meet ref. Last season, you could only have four total. So you can also judge a team once at home and twice away or be a meet ref away. Now, this meant that the signers have to pay a lot of attention to keep track of this, but it is an improvement for us. The written test, it's pass-fail. You need to score 80%. And remember, I'm using the modifications, the supplemental procedures and forms, and the USAG rules that we're supposed to know. When I used to take this, I would have all three documents with me while I took the exam. Another suggestion for when you're taking it, it's a good idea to write the numbers 1 to 50 and write down the answer to your FOIL. Several people had problems partway through and they lost it. Write down your A, B, C, D answer as you go along so that you have that in case the computer doesn't work. One of the things that we talked about is that we really have never talked about protocol for inquiries in terms of what the judges do. So this is just a simple summary of what should happen. The key part of it is that the chief judge takes responsibility unless the meet referee wants to. And it's up to the secondary judge or judges to participate when asked, but also not prolong the conference process. And we need to remind chief judges that it is not an educational time. They also need to be prompt in terms of getting the inquiry done. So the chief judge coordinates the answers. The chief judge will ask each judge for their start value and score, not what they did, but just their start value and score. And then that person coordinates the discussion for discrepancies. The video can be reviewed and the decision to adjust scores is made or not made. When you return to your seat, all judges need to reflash start values and scores, even if their score has not changed. And then the meet referee needs to work with the scoring table to update any scores. And the meet referee needs to return the inquiry to the coach. This is the new form for inquiries and routine summaries. The coaches need to put in the information for an inquiry, but that's the same information you will use for the routine summary. That's a sample of one that's been filled in. That's what you should see either if you get an inquiry or you get a routine summary. On Indusquad, I did 
we were filling in the routine summary at the bottom. It's a little tricky to go from one to one, two to two, but that's really what you're supposed to do in terms of your comments for your routine summary. Points of confusion on the inquiry, the video inquiry, and the video review. The coach may submit a written inquiry or a video inquiry, and there's no limit to the number of inquiries that can be submitted. The panel may review the video at regular speed or in slow motion, and they may review it multiple times. For the video review, it can only occur after a failed inquiry or a video inquiry, and it's completed at the end of the meet. There's only one video review per team, and there is no longer a deduction for submitting one. The reviews may not be used to evaluate questions of execution deductions or general composition. If the score is changed during an inquiry or a video review, the skill or connection under review is subject to additional deductions for incompletion or rhythm. This was new within the last year or so. And conferences should only occur when the counting scores are out of range or if there is an impossible start value or UTL that can have impact on the average score. A number of changes were made last year in terms of the unsportsmanlike conduct deduction. It applies to all team staff, not just to the person who you gave a warning to the first time. So a second yellow card may be given during the same occurrence if the behavior continues or escalates. If an athlete presents unsportsmanlike conduct is taken from the team score. There was a question whether it would come from the athlete score, but no, it's taken as a team score deduction. Now, the change is that the yellow card report must be completed this year, even if no deduction occurs. So if a yellow card warning is given, the report still needs to be done. In the past, their ethics committee and our jazz committees had no idea when the warning was given. So they've corrected this. So if there is a yellow card warning, the report still needs to be done. And the meet referee will fill out the incident report at the site of the competition for each meet where a yellow card was given and email the report to the National Collegiate Assigner and the chair of the Coaches Ethics Committee. The form is fairly simple, so you get to write whatever you want in terms of the information. If a judge gives a yellow card, she may wish to write the report with the meet referee. You need to have some copies of that yellow card report form with you so that you can do a report if it happens at a meet. Missing a judge procedures when either because of illness or whether judges were missing from the meet. Different things have been done in the past. Judge was asked to judge one vault, turn their head and judge a bars routine, go back and do another vault, etc. The feeling was that that was very difficult for the judge to keep consistency. So the Coaches Association accepted this proposal. So the first thing is, if there's a walking meet ref, that person fills in as the acting judge. If the meet doesn't have a walking meet ref, then the format that is used is the one that's on the next couple pages. But what it basically does is splits out one official to be a traveling judge. And that person would be designated by the meet referee to judge in the absent judge and their own event. So the two judges start at vaulting for team one. Team two will need to decide when they're going to start warming up bars, depending on the timing of the meet. When the traveling judges finish judging team one on vault, they go over to bars and judge team two on bars. That judge will stay on bars while team one completes their one touch and competes. And then team two can go over and begin their one touch on vault at their discretion, keeping in mind the timing of the meet. The traveling judge then goes back to vault to judge team two. And the process gets repeated for beam and floor. If the score sheet didn't get signed immediately, we proposed that they only had to stay there for 20 minutes. This summer in the regional congresses, we thought that this had been passed, but it hasn't. This year, there is a proposal going forward that will update you when we know what's happening. A couple of general things. 
Don't forget to read the back of the modification so you're familiar with those rules. And this one on the cables was something they passed last year, and I don't think it's in any of the documents. So if the cable or the T-handles on the uneven bars is to drop during a routine, this should be considered an equipment failure. We were pleased last spring that the ethics committee for the Coaches Association wrote their statement on the use of social media. It's considered unprofessional to use social media in a negative manner. Specifically, criticizing officials in a public forum does not align with our code of ethics as a professional organization. One of the questions that comes up once in a while is what is this whole thing in terms of qualifying and why is it so important to the teams? You're well aware that six gymnasts compete in an event. Top five scores count for that event score. The team score from each meet is used to determine what's called the NQS, National Qualifying Score. It's made up of the top six team scores from the season. Three of those scores must come on the road, must be an away meet, or at a neutral site. They then remove the highest score and average the remaining five. Of the 10 to 13 meets during the season, they are all included, as are the conference meets. But NQS doesn't get posted on the road to nationals until about week eight. There are four regional championships, as of last year, they staggered the dates. Two start on one date and two start on another date. And that was done for viewership purposes so that there was more opportunity for television coverage. One of the things that was added for this year is the team remaining in the championships with the highest seed is going to be assigned to the evening session for both regionals and nationals, also for TV coverage and interest from the fans. The championship provides for a field of 36 teams determined based on their NQS. Teams 1 through 16 are seeded by the NCAA championship committee, and the remaining teams are placed geographically at one of the four regional sites. Included in the championship field are also 12 all-around competitors and 64 individual event specialists, all of whom are not on a qualifying team. New this year is that any all-around competitor in round one must be assigned to the evening session of round two. They are also going to designate alternates for both regionals and nationals. And they put the selection show right after the conference meet. It's usually on that Monday. They're moving it back a day so the teams have time to travel. So if you're interested in watching that, it's available on the NCAA site there are 84 institutions that sponsor women's collegiate gymnastics and are eligible for regional and then the national championships. As judges, we need to keep that in mind, that there could be a gymnast on a D2 or a D3 meet who should be able to qualify because the rules are the same for all 84 colleges. Those 84 programs support approximately 3,500 women's gymnastics student athletes across the country. Postseason assignment. This is what is published by the NCAA about their process. First of all, you must have to have judged four regular season meets during the current season. We've always called it regionals. They're trying to now call it round one, round two, and round three. They select the meet referees first, and they can serve for no more than two consecutive years. Then they take the list that we submit and they remove the names. And then they select six judges, one from each region, to go on to the four regional meets with no more than two from each state for the regionals that are now called round one, round two, and round three. For the national championships, the judge must have judged at regionals to judge at nationals. The meet referee is rotated regionally every two years, and the National Committee has been very consistent about that. The meet referees from the regional meets become the chief judges at nationals, and then the remaining judges are selected from each region, only one per state, 
and a local alternate is identified for each region. This year, they are requesting that we try to get two judges to volunteer as line judges at round one, round two, round three, and nationals. The regional meets are at Michigan, at Berkeley, California, at Arkansas, and at Florida. If you are interested in coordinating the auxiliary judges for a meet, send me an email. So it's a volunteer situation. The NCAA has no process for funding to help uh, the volunteer judges, but it is a great experience to be on the floor and close up at the meet. So the dates are April 3rd through 6th, which is the regional, and the nationals is April 18th through 20th in Texas. The conference championships are all on March 23rd, and this year the Division Three meet was moved to that date. There are also two other meets, Division One FCS and Division Two and Three schools can qualify to a USAG sponsored national championship. It's held the weekend between NCAA rounds one, two, and three at nationals. This year it's at Westchester University, April 12th through 14th. Most Division Three schools can qualify to a Division Three championship. It's usually held the weekend after conferences, but this year it's the same weekend as the conferences because of Easter. It's assigned by the National Signer, and it's at Ursinus College in Pennsylvania. That, I think, is everything.